Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, hello. And today I have the honor of uh, having a conversation with Lord Megna Desai, who is a polymath. He wears many hats. He is, he has been an economist. He's taught at Dillon School of Economist for, uh, since the 60s. He's a labor politician. He has written about cinema, he's written about Marx, he's written about philosophy, religion, literature. So it, it's just his range of writing is so diverse and his achievements are so diverse that I just can't summarize it to you right now. And most of you are, since most of you are aware of him already, it's useless to do the interview with the formal, like formality. Lord Desai, it's an honor to have you over here. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Go ahead, ask me anything. So I around, I, I met you around a year ago. We had a brief meeting and I gave you my book, which you were kind enough to read and tell me what you thought about it. So since you describe yourself as an atheist and you haven't talked about it much, so I thought it would be a good, uh, Thing to get what you think about it. You said that you don't feel the need to defend your atheism, but you do uh, want to tackle the question of why people believe. So why don't you go ahead and tell me why you think people, the majority of people are religion despite the evidence for science. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm, let me say, I'm not an aggressive atheist. I don't want to convert people. I am thinking, I am an atheist. And I, I have studied religion very much, all the major religions. I, you know, my wife is, uh, is a believer. She's sort of a Sufi type believer. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, some of my best friends are, are believers. But one question we could ask is, what does religion do for people? You know, why do I, how can I carry on without religion? And why do most people, you know, 99.9% or .9 whatever. Now my view is that religion is first of all, a, a, an answer to the problem of death. See, death is a very, very interesting phenomenon. Uh, as I get older, of course, I, I see more people dying around me and so on. But you know, you can't believe, if I was to die in the next five minutes, you would find it difficult to understand that I was talking to you here and suddenly I'm gone, totally gone. There's no chance that I could be revived. Or, and I think people find that to be the most upsetting experience in life. In life, the most upsetting experience is death. Somebody else is death, obviously. And when, when, when you are dead, you're gone, you, you don't care. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't believe in soul or something like that, you know. I think, see, people find it so hard to accept the totality of death that they invent. And no, no, he's not gone. Actually, his soul is around or, or he's gone to heaven or, or you know. I mean, we, we need to make excuses for the absoluteness of death. That's one thing. So all religions have this consolation for death. No, you're not dead, you know. You say, you know, Gandhiji is dead, Gandhiji Amar Raho. You know, the first thing is Amar Raho, because we don't want someone to go. Dilip Kumar, Dilip Kumar died, Amar Raho. Now, thing is, okay, that's one thing. But I think there's another uh, explanation for belief, not so much in afterlife, but in God. God as a doer. God as a creator, as a sustainer as a person who makes things go around. And then I think it's because people don't like things which are unexplained. You know, people want an explanation. People want not an explanation. They want an authorial explanation, i.e. who did this? My, my example is a two uh, uh, experience I've had uh, way back in 1963 when John Kennedy died. And John Kennedy was shot. You know, it was so unlikely an event. I didn't actually see it and it happened, but I heard it on the radio before he died. Then he's in the hospital and they say, and then of course I've seen the film several times. Now, you know, 
it is just not possible to believe that somebody 42 years of age, president of the United States, so powerful, so well protected, could die. Just like that, you know. And it's a complete turmoil. People say, who did it? Why did God allow this to happen? Or, or when uh, Princess Diana died in a car accident, you know, suddenly, oh my God, she's dead. She's from 1997, I think, uh, the independ India Independence Day. Now, that sort of thing that happens, what I call a random event. People don't like random events. They want an explanation of why it happened, who did it, who is responsible, and why couldn't somebody prevent it. Randomness is something people find very hard to believe. People want a systematic explanation. I think those two reasons are very powerful reasons why people like, you know, believe in religion. And yeah, I, by, by religion, I mean not this hyperfluting uh, with anti philosophy and all that sort of stuff. But like my mother used to do, I'm sure you, uh, your uh, people in your family, what we call Shraddha or Bhakti. Bhakti is Bhakti, you know, there, there are no questions asked. I worship Mother Goddess or I worship Krishna or anything like that. And then that's it, it's an absolute faith. Now, obviously, people need that. And people say, oh, you know, you don't believe in religion, but you believe in philosophy or, you know, economics or something like that. But that, that, that is not an equivalent because the, the big questions of life, as we say, you know, require an answer. And some, some people, if they don't have the answer, they feel helpless, they feel rudderless. They need in their everyday thing some idea that, no, the world is a systematic place, is being run by uh, you know, some benevolent authority and it will go on running it. So the so idea that, that, of uh, God may have started out as an explanation for say, we can't explain why it's raining or things like that. But as we have sort of moved away from that, you know, the enlightenment era, the scientific age, we can explain things without resorting to the God of the gaps argument. So why do you think that people continue to believe it when they have precedence that all of these things that we couldn't explain, we we're now able to explain it because of science. So why not just try to explain the things that we can't explain now? Why not resort to science instead? Why resort to the argument of God for which there is no evidence? Uh, you know, in, in, in a sense, uh, while I am sympathetic of the view that uh, there's a perfectly good scientific explanation available for everything that, that happens. And some, and randomness is a perfectly scientific uh, uh, concept. I think, you know, I always used to be puzzled. How can a professor of science believe in God? How can a physicist or can a biologist? And I'm sure there is Darwin, you read Darwin and, and more or less that's the story. And we have uh, astrophysics and astrophysics can go into, you know, the first nanoseconds of the, of the Big Bang and so on. But, you know, it actually doesn't satisfy, my theory, it doesn't satisfy deep urge for an authorial presence. People say, no, no, that doesn't matter. But who started the Big Bang? You know, who, you know, there was nothing there, suddenly you say, it started, what do you mean it started? Somebody must have started it. Because our human experience is, you know, nothing happens unless somebody starts it. Uh, so then we, you know, the long ago, uh, um, the man called Feuerbach, um, the German philosopher whom Marx was very much influenced yeah. by, part of, you know, early 19th century. That's when the first skeptical attacks on Christianity has started. And uh, he said, uh, Feuerbach said, we create God's universal name and then ask them to rule over us. You know, I mean, what's called fetishism. You know, we, we create these creatures and then they rule over us, as it were. But of course, you know, no, nobody, you know, uh, you know, the usual question is, if God is benevolent, why does he allow uh, evil to persist? 
or the good people to suffer. But you know, there is no God creating. Evil, evil may be there, good people may suffer, but there are perfectly good explanations of why good people suffer. Uh, God hasn't done anything this year that way. But people don't want that, you know, especially when there is a victimless crime or victimless suffering. You know, there's, there's a woman called Annie Besant. You may have heard of her. She yeah. came to India and she was a theosophist. Theosophist. Uh, yeah, and she was, she was, she was a respectable family. She, she married a man who was a, a priest in the Church of England. And her daughter fell very ill once. And just if he was somewhere else, you know, preaching and she was at home. And she said, how does God allow such suffering on an innocent girl? You know, what is the answer? I mean, she, she then, you know, and she went and saw some big expert of the day, but big theologian. And he said, Madam, you read too much. Stop reading. You know, you just accept what God does, you accept. God has his own reason, his or her own reason for doing serious plans. Yeah. Now, you see, this is, you know, this is to me and you, and maybe sound is very, very peculiar. But, you know, as I said, 99% of the world actually believes in it. And uh, uh, it, it, you you find that even, even in India, there are. Uh, there are people who thought we are secularists or something like that. And I always say, just one minute, somebody is trying to call me. Urjit, can I call you later? Uh, yes, yes, okay. You okay. Will call me or? I'll call you. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, you see, so, uh, what I was talking about, uh, yeah, people, uh, or what I say, in the front room, they are secularists, and they talk about Vivekananda if they have to talk about religion. In the inside rooms and kitchen, they have a God. <laughs> they worship. You see, because, you know, in a sense, uh, people, people who are, who are, say, oh, we are secular. You see, we always find men talking about Upanishads. Sorry, you 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 listen to a lecture of mine. You know, open each other. Why? Because it's kind of macho. You know, you're not talking about you know worshiping gods. You worship. You talk about philosophy and Advaita and all that. But see, my mother never worried about Advaita. She never read any Upanishad. She had a small lithograph of of um, uh, Amba Mata, you know, like like Durga, and she and she prayed prayed to that. And that, yes, that is yeah. that is to me, you know, genuine religion. Don't give me yes, this philosophy yes. nonsense. You know, that is an yeah. so. Now, you see, it's that we have to understand the power of that belief as rationalists. How yes, is it that, yes. that that belief, you know, 98, 99% people believe in it. So we, we are just an exception. I'm just an exception as an atheist. But I am enough of a rational person to want to understand why people believe. I don't know they're stupid or they're irrational. That, that is, that's arrogance. Yeah. One has to understand. I mean, you know, actually, but even otherwise, if you read the religious uh, texts, if you read the New, New Testament, you know, it's a beautiful thing to read as well. I mean, it's, 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 there's, a, there's a joy in reading a, Urjit, I'm talking to a class. <laughs> oh, you're talking to a class? Sorry. On Zoom, on Zoom, on Zoom, sorry. Okay, yes, yeah, so I'll call you later. Sorry about that. Thank you, Okay. Sorry, it, it, was, it was Dr. Urjit Patel, who was the governor of Reserve Bank of India previously. Uh -huh, right. Uh, anyway, so, uh, so, so, no, so now ask me the next question. Ask me another question. Right, so um, I have, you know, I, I was just going through your thoughts about the Bhagavad Gita yesterday, and you have some very strong critiques of it. Would you like to, if you think that the central 
message of Bhagavad Gita is essentially go kill. Like, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, you see, I mean, I, I, I find Bhagavad Gita a very, very, very interesting book, obviously. Uh, I mean, there are all sorts of complications. Do you believe the standard story that one fine morning in the battle of, on the field of Kurukshetra, there was Arjuna and there was Krishna and Arjuna, the nervous breakdown, so they, they parked the chariot in the middle there and have this, uh, you know, 700 shloka uh, dialogue. Uh, and then, mm -hmm. now, you know, even uh, Swami Vivekanan said, then the Bhagavad Gita was inserted later on. What's very interesting thing about the Bhagavad Gita is that there is no commentary on it before Shankara, Adi Shankaracharya uh, has the first commentary in the eighth century uh, AD, right? It's very unusual. If it was preached at the time of the Mahabharata, we should have many commentaries on it. And in the Mahabharata, it appears in the Krishna Parva. Not even at the beginning. At their 23rd to 40. Now, so, so anyway, so I was just curious that can I treat it as a human text, humanly composed text? And actually, I was in the first person. I, mean, I don't know if you read the book, but there was a, a very distinguished Maharashtrian scholar, a real Orthodox. RSS member, the Maharashtra Brahmin, and he knew the Bhagavad Gita sort of word by word, and he would recite it. And after a while, he found that there were three different styles in which you know people were addressed, you know, Krishna was addressed, and so on. So he hypothesized that the Bhagavad Gita was put together from three separate. Uh, uh, Expositions of philosophy. And somebody made me a question. And I, I thought they were very fascinating. I wrote about it. And uh, I, I haven't had any, any thorough refutation or anything like that. People say, oh, Meghnad is like that, you know. He has his ideas of him, done it. Nobody. So I think there is a very interesting uh, idea here that it could have been a text put together. As a teaching text, you know, one bit teaches the Advaita, other teaches Bhakti, uh, you know, the Bhakti doctrine, and then the Sankhya. So there are these three, three parts of it. And now, uh, so it's quite plausible. Now, when it became this huge, super uh, holy text, I don't know, but that's pretty much a very modern Indian thing. So I point out that uh, Justice Talon in the 19th century, uh, who was the first uh, English translator, uh, he says, as a work of philosophy, this is not very good, <laughs> right? He says, oh, it's all right, yeah. but, and you know, so the huge reputation of Bhagavad Gita is very much a 20th century phenomenon. Because there are absolutely no other, you know, uh, and as I said, until, until Adi Shankaracharya writes a commentary, uh, that there is, there is no commentary. And Vivekanan said, Adi Shankaracharya wrote the Bhagavad Gita and inserted it into the Mahabharata. I mean, it, I, I, don't, I, I don't agree with uh, uh, Swami Vivekanan on that. But, is it, but as a text, it's become almost central to Indian culture and philosophy. And Indian kind of nationhood. You know, Radha Krishna wrote about it and all sorts of people write about it. Nowadays, you know, in, in, in good middle class families, you have a huge volume of Bhagavad Gita sitting on the you know in the front row and the chariot and things like that. It's like a consumer durable. But it is actually uh, in an intensely bhakti oriented, because the center part is the bhakti part. But Krishna says, forget about everything, just believe in me, and that's all you need to do. You know, there's of course Sankhya there, then bhakti is the central. Now, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating. What my, uh, as you read it, so I'm just, my 
two sort of uh, political objections are, first of all, that it, uh, it sanctifies the uh, World National Dharma. And uh, it definitely describes the, the Vaishya and the Shudras, Vaishya uh, and Shudras, uh, as having no gunas. Kshatriyas have a lot of gunas, Brahmanas have a lot of gunas. There's a whole, whole sort of, you know, in the 18th of the there is a whole eight shlokas about that. And then they say, you know, Vaishyas and Shudras do what they do. They define by what they do, not what they are. So there's a quite clear distinction between the upper two and, and lower two. And it is very dismissive of women. There are only two shlokas which women are men mentioned, and both in very pejorative way. So I basically was saying that for modern India, given the constitution it has, it is not in the spirit of the modern constitution. After all, you know, Ambedkar wouldn't have anything to do with Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and he, he had no respect for it. So, you know, I I wrote it because I thought, I, I just was going to get it out of my system. I, so I why, don't know. Why do because you think that it's so, um, it has been popularized when we actually have better text with you know better philosophy and better arguments. We have the Lokayatas, we have the dualism school of thought. So amidst so many complex and philosophically vigorous school of thought, what do you think it's the Bhagavad Gita, which uh, is you know said to be the holy book of Hinduism? I think the thing, thing about uh, Bhagavad Gita here. Now, it's a beautiful piece of Sanskrit verse. It's a beautifully written piece. I mean, in the one single uh, sort of meter, the Anushtu meter, because 700 uh, shlokas. And someone some at some stage took these three pieces of whatever verse and made it into a single text. You know, I, in my book, I say it was Mother Anne most probably who did this. But somebody put it together, made it look like a whole. It's very short compared to, you know, the Rigveda or thing like that, or, or Lokaya. Uh, and uh, you see, Lokaya and arguments like that, which when I was a, a teenager, we were very much reading that stuff because when I, in 1950s, uh, the communists were very important intellectual influence on our lives, you know, and people used to write about uh, Lokaya. They wanted to deconstruct the, the old Hindu uh, uh, stuff. And so we all read that, but in a sense, Lokaya is not uh, possible to be made popular. You know, it has always been a heterodox school. Yeah, a yeah, heterodox school, but it's basically a argument that you can have among philosophers, but you can't go to a household and say, listen, you know, this is the thing. Whereas, uh, uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita has aphorisms for life, you know, believe in this, do this. And it is an authoritative sound. Whereas Lokayat and are kind of skeptical questions about, about philosophy existence. Bhagavad Gita doesn't ask questions, it answers them. You see, and, and, and you, know, you know, because authority is of God, that, that's it, you know. <laughs> but beautifully written. I mean, if, if, you, if you kind of uh, admire Sanskrit uh, poetry, I mean, it is one of the most beautifully written, written stuff that there is. And so people like Radha Krishna and so on were able to make it popular. Uh, you know, all, all popularity of Bhagavad Gita is 20th century popularity, I think. Uh, because remember, um, uh, Gandhiji says that it was when he was in London that some some uh, uh, Christians came to him uh, and said, will you please uh, read the Bhagavad Gita with us? And he said he had no idea. And his father had been told to recite a few uh, verses for, you know, for his own spiritual health. But he hadn't read it. It wasn't that popular at that time. And so he gets to the Bhagavad Gita in London. And because there is an English translation 
Uh, so was, I yeah. think Edwin Arnold's. Uh, yeah, story. exactly. Edwin Arnold. So it's very interesting that that, that Mohandas Gandhi actually gets his Hinduism in London because the Bhagavad Gita had been made popular, and he, as he said, he was ashamed that he did not know this and he did not know Sanskrit. So then he, uh, but I think I think his own commentary on Bhagavad Gita is not interesting. So that's another story. But uh, I mean, it is. It became a self, one single text of independent India. Somehow, yes, we are a secular nation and all that. But the Bhagavad Gita became a secular, secular text, almost a secular text of independent India. And uh, and most people haven't read. Right? People say Karman Nevadi Karas Ne Mahasadeshu. That's all people know the people from my literature. And um, I mean, for, for even in that verse, the word karma, uh, as Ambedkar points out, karma was used in the Veda, in the Veda. That karma was basically your duty to keep a fire burning or have a yagna if you were a prosperous person. When you had, when you held a yagna, all the peace and so on. Sometimes you did it to get some fruit, children or cows or whatever it is. The greater, the greater. It's always give us cows, give us, give us sons and so on. And so the, the Bhagavad Gita, which is post Vedic, says, "Do the karma, but don't don't do it for the sake of a fruit." You know, don't be purposive in your performance of rituals. This is the post-Vedic uh, law. Now, very few people know the full meaning of those words because people don't think it comes from a whole, whole uh, tradition of a religious debate. But it's a beautiful verse. You know, it, it's universally applicable. You know, do selflessly. Don't expect a fruit. Just do it. And the, the fruit comes. Do you not think that's uh, similar, a bit similar to say the Protestant ethic? Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it is, it is, uh, it is what I call functional ethics. You know, it, it's not a bad thing to have it. Go and do what you have to do. Uh, whether you succeed in getting what you did or not, it doesn't matter. The work is its own reward. The deed is its own reward. And, uh, and what what happens uh, as a result of it is a matter of chance. That, that's the way, I, you know, uh, like you go to the Olympics and you run the race, you run the best race you can, whether you get a medal or not, is a separate thing, but going in plain is, is a, so I mean, I think it, only some parts of the Bhagavad Gita are popular. A lot of the Sankhya pieces of the very hardly ever cited. The first, the first two thirds is very, because the bhakti thing is very, very popular. Uh, but uh, you know, it is it is a central text, and people uncritically accept it. When one has to look at it carefully and see what it says. In all right. documents, the human documents. Uh -huh. So. Um, I'm also reading through your, uh, you know, book on Marx. The I think it's called Marx Revenge. So you Marx started Revenge. out as yeah. a Marxist eventually uh, when in the 60s. I think you. I don't know if you would describe yourself as a Marxist now, but you essentially argue that you know the normal assumption is that the rate of pro that Marx predicts that the rate of profit you know falls down and that eventually leads to the collapse of capitalism. You, on the other hand, argue that that isn't what Marx argues. He argues that the rate of profit declines in sort of cyclical uptowns and downturns, and that may or may not lead to uh, sort of the collapse of capitalism, which is seen as a sort of tendency, not a definite prediction. So why do you think uh, that's the case? Well, you see, basically, let me put it this way. Most people who say they're Marxist, they're Leninists. Most people don't know the difference. But the, the Communist Party as a party, political party, political program, is an invention of Lenin, not of Marx. A Marx, as it were, and there was a party established in his lifetime uh, 
which, which claimed to be based on his philosophy in, in 1870s, uh, a merger of two left parties. And the present German Social Democratic Party is a descendant of that party. Now, Marx himself wrote a critique of the program of that party. It's called Critique, critique of, of the Gosa program. program yeah. uh, so, here is it. I'll go by the Communist Manifesto. If you read the Communist Manifesto, half of it, or more than half of it, is a praise of the disruptive and transformative power of capitalism. Innovative, you know, it goes out and conquers the whole world, and, and all that is solid melts into the air, all that is uh, uh, sacred is profaned, and all that. Beautiful. And his vision was that this, this uh, progressive transformation of the world caused by capitalism will go on. Uh, I mean, he wrote it in 1848. Uh, and when the railways were just coming on, you, you had cotton textile manufacturing, railways were just coming on, and he was much more ahead. So, in a sense, and the only time he makes a prediction is in a, a preface to the uh, contribution to the critique of political economy. You know, there's one paragraph there that no, no mode of production disappears before its full potential is realized. Right? So that, that is the text in which I was relying and saying capitalism has still a lot of innovative power left in it. It's not going to be destroyed just because somebody doesn't like it or somebody says, oh, it creates poverty and all this and stuff. So Lenin changed his mind because he thought the First World War was the really very crucial thing. Because in, during the First World War, the German uh, <clears throat> Socialist Party, the largest social powerful party, surrendered and became nationalist rather than internationalist. So he was very disappointed. And of course, then luckily he he had a successful revolution. So he changed the whole timetable of the collapse of capitalism. Nothing, nothing that had happened. Luckily also, the Great Depression came in, a, for, for the communists, Great Depression came in the 1930s. So in a war, and, and it looked like capitalism as a global system was in real, real challenge. Uh, and of course, then nationalism rose and so on. I have I lived long enough to be able to see the collapse of communism. You know, I mean, China is communist, but a very different kind. Uh, but that is the Soviet Union. You can't believe how big the Soviet Union when I was a teenager. It was the future. Every, in, in India, lots and lots of people. I still know people when I come to India. People, my 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 older brother, people like that. They're still waiting. They're thinking, what is the next analysis? What is the new analysis of the collapse of capitalism? I said, not gonna happen. It's sort of, you know. So I don't see Marx as definitely timetabling the collapse of capitalism. He's not an astrologer, right? I, in a sense, as, as I say in the book, they were very influenced by uh, Isaac Newton's uh, analysis of how planets move. And so they wanted to have a, a what I call social astronomy, a map of how societies uh, move and grow. And, and it, part of social astronomy is not, not just Marx, it comes from Adam Smith and people like that. They all wanted to know how, the, how Western Europe arrived at the present juncture through time. And there are other societies, hunting and gathering societies. And they wanted to, they knew enough about global history. So they had a single, pattern, uh, you know, hunting and gathering, uh, sort of uh, pastoral culture, agriculture, then commerce, and then capitalism. And capitalism, the word capitalism was not used, but, you know. So, midway into this tree, the First World War happened, and Lenin suddenly said, you know, this is it. This is the final uh, end game of of capital, and, and he got into power. So that influenced a lot of people. I mean, communism was huge. And there are many, many idealistic people were in communism. And the whole, and I've read a lot of literature. I'm Marxist in the sense, I've read a lot about Marxism. I can teach it and so on. But I'm basically a social democrat. 
you know, I'm a social democrat who has read Marx. And I'm, I, I guess now, more pessimistic about the, even the prospect of socialism uh, that, that one thought might come. So, yes, capitalism will go on. It'll be, there'll be reformist movements like social democratic movements. But even China, while it calls itself the Communist Party, it's not really communist like Soviet Union was. The confidence that generation had that, you know, day after tomorrow, capitalism will go. That is gone. So I wrote a whole book about that. Uh, and that's one of my best selling books. That, uh, in a sense, we've lived through uh, the end of one history, end of one doctrine, which everybody thought was scientific. You know, the whole claim was Marx was had a scientific socialism, and the science was a big thing. Uh, you know, why I don't but know. Then Marx himself claimed that he was being scientific and Engels in his, uh, I think, uh, when Marx died, Engels called him, compared him with Darwin and Newton. So. No, 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 no. Basically, uh, Engels did compare uh, Marx to Darwin when he died uh, at, at his grave. Uh, but the idea of that this is science, social science, uh, about a century before Marx, uh, people like Adam Smith, uh, Condorcet, and people like that had made this what I call social astronomy how societies will move through stages. What, what it became as it a law of history, only under Lenin. You know, it, it, because the, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx mentions this. But apart from that, only in the uh, preface to the uh, contribution to the critique of political economy, which I quote from, that's the only time Marx mentions his modes of production and talks about what will happen, when will, when will capitalism go? And he says, only when it is uh, no longer uh, productive, no longer innovative. Uh, and after that, what will come is socialism, very different thing, not like state ownership, because Marx doesn't discuss the state at all. Marx is not interested in the state. The idea that the state could run the economy would be completely foreign to Marx. Uh, that all comes up under, under Leninism. Uh, and of course, the Fabian commanding heights of the economy should be captured by the state. Marx was very much an anarchist. He saw no, he saw no virtue in the state. But so, I don't think he was an anarchist because he, you know, back I, against critique holds up. And he sorry? believed in the dictatorship of the proletariat and back when it was very, you know, critical of Marx back in and building both of them. So I don't really see Marx as an anarchist. I think he believed that uh, after the end of capitalism, there will be a dictatorship of the proletariat, which is no, which no, is. I, what, I tell you, what, all all that all that you have uh, in in Marx on the state after capitalism is. Uh, a kind of personal thing written when you're very young. And I want to have, I want to be able to, uh, you know, uh, tend cattle in the morning and go fishing in the afternoon and write poetry. Uh, yeah. I, it, it was mainly like a, self, a world of self employed people doing, doing variety of things. But it, it's very kind of soft thing, you know, that, that makes it. Uh, the, the, the Leninists did write about it. Uh, they, they had, they more or less wanted to say, well, what well, they had got was, was uh, not so, uh, communism yet, but the socialism and then will come communism and all that to each according to his need and, and from each according to his religions. Now, that particular picture of the economy, as I say in uh, my uh, Marx's Revenge, comes out of the German war machine. Germany fought the First World War and invented planning. A planned economy was first practiced by Germany in the First World War. And although Germans lost the war, Lenin was very impressed by the economic arrangement that the, the Germans ran the whole economy like a single firm. 
So completely centralized single firm, all allocations done from the top. And the Soviet Union made a virtue of it. And then finally lost the battle. Uh, so uh, th this is what I wanted to point out in, in that book, that there was a ready-made doctrine of how and what kind of socialism would come. It happened to lose. You know, because after all, what Lenin didn't, didn't uh, take on board is that the Germans actually lost the war. The centralized fighting machine did not actually win the war. A kind of compromise of bit of state, bit of market that uh, England fought on. They won. So why do you think the losing war? Uh, but everybody's all planning, central planning, absolutely everybody, everything organized in one thing, will win. And that didn't, that didn't work uh, rather. So even China has a combination of market forces and, and central command, things like that. Uh, there was a time when, literally a time when from Beijing every morning, they would send orders to all cities in China what the price of different vegetables was going to be. They, they stopped off. You know, that, that is a combination of a, of some sort of market choice and so on, and some allocation. And of course, China takes is a, a lot of foreign capital. Uh, so it's not actually kind of pure communist economy. It's not even a state capitalist economy because the state only owns part of the economy, a lot of private sector uh, funds as well. So in a sense, what China has done is develop a variant of capitalism under a single political party leadership and with some parameters in the hand of the state, but with lots and lots of freedom. And so we don't know which way the next, next uh, stage would come. But, uh, you know, the, you know we, nobody thought about uh, uh, Google and, and Apple and things like that. And our, our lives have been transformed by the mm -hmm. telephone. You know, and uh, it, it is just amazing to believe, amazing to imagine where capitalism will go next. Do you think uh, that, you know, I think that you can make an argument for industrialization from a Marxist, you know, from Marx's perspective, because Marx seems to believe that capitalism was a necessary stage that societies which have not achieved the level sustainability if an attempt to form a socialist nation in that society happens then it will result you know in Marx word the same filthy business same old business essentially so I think that Marx saw capitalism as a not an it, as an indispensable position in his sort of stages of history it's, it's not a position that you can you know, do away with so in India's case, you know, where we have so much centralized planning, do you think that, well, first, do you think that we can make a Marxist argument for in industrialization and free market? Second, do you think that, uh, you know, are you happy with the state of India's economy right now? Well, you know, Marx was only occupied as an economist analyzing capitalism. He, he only looked at the market problem, nothing else. And you see, his training as a philosopher is very important in this case because, I mean, this is also true in, if you've done Hindi philosophy. The way philosophers were trained was if you want to criticize the system, master it first, and then point out its inner contradictions. It's called an immanent critique. So Marx basically wanted to study what Ricardo had done for political economy. And within the Ricardian system, wanted to point out that profits came from exploitation. That's the sum total of Marx as well. It happens to be a very difficult proposition to prove, but Marx spent his whole life trying to say that profits came from exploitation of labor power, of living labor power. And so surplus value, the notion of surplus value is not anywhere else in, 
in the economic report, Marx. So Marx, and he never finished the proof because the volume three is you know, left messy and all that. You, you can read about it in, in, in my books. So he was not interested in policy questions. The idea that economy should worry about design of planning systems was that completely. He is not interested. Uh, he was a philosopher critic of the classical political economy. And he took all the assumptions of uh, Ricardo and Smith and Marx. I mean, the market works perfectly. There are, there, is are not, value. There, 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 there is no inequality of power, none, none of that. With all the market working, with free exchange between worker and uh, the employer, can I show that profits come from expertise? That, that is that's the one proposition on what Marx spent 30 years of his life. And I can tell you, I having done a lot of them, it has still not been properly proven. Okay. Uh, now, it may be proven, but I don't know. Uh, I, I only analyze what they have done. I have done my own proof. Uh, I'm actually not interested because the interesting thing is capitalism keeps on changing. Uh, when you think about surplus value and exploitation, you think of misery. Now, you're, now Google or uh, Apple uh, exploits you while giving you pleasure. You generate profits for them by, by having fun on the telephone. You play a game on telephone and it makes profits for them, right? So, I mean, it, it's, it's a clever system. So exploitation of my horrible stuff. So, in a sense, Marx was trying to understand and analyze and make a critique of capitalism, given all the assumptions uh, as acceptable. You know, idea that the market doesn't work, or the monopoly, you're not interested in all that stuff. That is second order stuff. So most people have forgotten that Marx had nothing to do with the state. He never worried about it. Lenin uh, actually, in a few months before the October Revolution, there was a faction in Russia called uh, the Socialist Revolutionary like SR, who were anarchists. So Lenin wrote a pamphlet on on the state and uh, forget now, getting every anarchistic quote from Marx. Saying you know, we Marxists are actually anarchists, we're not statists. Very clever pamphlet. And, and, he, and he got the support of the SR people. Uh, and uh, of course, as soon as he got into power, they forgot all about anarchism and, uh, and then he became a, a very centralist. But uh, Marx himself is no discussion. He doesn't believe in reform, he doesn't believe in legislation. How many analyzes the, the, the laws passed on? length of the working day and so on. But he doesn't think you know, we should capture power and, and transform something. That comes on later. People were inspired by it. Some people thought his thoughts may lead to get, getting a transformation done by human effort. Whereas the idea is, it's like laws of Newton. This stuff moves following a certain laws and we have to discover those laws. You can't disturb the laws. You can't change the movement of planets just because you understand them. And the, and the notion, no, you could say, listen, the analogy is not perfect between the sky and a society. You know, the, the sky has roles of so on. Societies are malleable. But that, that's a whole separate. Or you can even say that these laws of uh, societies going through this uh, evolutionary category is only for Western Europe, not for, not for the whole world and all that. But those, those are different issues. Marx is not interested in any of that. He did, he did literal enemy. He, he wrote lots and lots and lots in just summarizing what he had read in economics. You know, three volumes of uh, theories of surplus value, three volumes of capital, you know, okay, not properly finished. But he's not interested in economic policy. In, because in 19th century, people didn't think 
the state could make economic policy. The market, the state didn't make policies. So Marx was it, essentially a disinterested uh, economic historian. Like that's how he portrayed. No, I mean, he he knew a lot. He had read a lot of history, but he was not interested in running an economy. Uh, just, just, there is no applied, you know, poli a Marxist policy, uh, science as it were. That was all done after the First World War and then in the Soviet Union. There is in, in Marx in volume two, uh, though the first time in economics where he writes down the model of an economy in two sectors, machine making sectors and consumer good making sector. And the first time in history of economics, this way of what we call macroeconomic, this way of having a two sector model of the economy. And he was trying to basically answer the question of whether, how, how an economy is a self reproducing mechanism. You know, how, what you call the, uh, the circular flow of income, you know, spending, spending, Producing and spending are interconnected. Because in the course of production, incomes are generated, and those incomes are spent on what has been produced, and that re re renews the cycle. He was the first economist to have understood it, and then analyzed how such an economy would grow over time. Unfortunately, or fortunately, short of showing, showing that such an economy can go on developing forever without any cycles. And so after he died, this book came out, volume two came out. And the Marxists were absolutely shocked that the great guru had shown that the capitalist economy can grow without a cycle. And the huge controversy, Rosa Luxemburg, Lenin, Bukharin, all them writing about it. But he, he, he did prove that capitalism can be without cycles. In a two-sector model, so, you know, most 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 communists have never read Marx. They, they may have read the Communist Manifest, never read Marx. It's not easy to read. I mean, this is very tough stuff. Well, it's three thousand pages, so. Sorry. It's three thousand pages long, so I would assume that most communists have, you know, won't bother to read Marx, but. Um, if you read, for instance, the critique of both our program, I think that is enough to see that the modern social democratic policies, as it were, are the modern assumptions that people have about Marxism are refuted by Marx in that small pamphlet, you know, which is, I think, one of the last things that he wrote, the Gotha program. So it's easy to, um, I think if you have read enough, it's easy to understand where Marx comes from, you know, given how distorted we, the Leninist, as you point out, have made uh, Marxism to be. But at the same time, I understand that the impulse is rather an, a religious impulse, you know, almost a need to help people. So I understand that why they would even like to Put it, it is like what we were talking about religion before. People need a definite answer. They can accept unquestioningly. So and so said that it must be true. Right? Marx said that. They, they don't really write it. Uh, and so it makes life easy. You know, if you know that tomorrow all your miseries are going to go and communism is going to come. Life makes it become so much easier. Uh, and uh, I, mean, I, I literally cannot explain to you how, how deeply we were convinced that communism was the future. And the question was not if, but when India will become communist. It, it, it's quite astonishing. Right. Uh, Christopher Hitchens actually compared his loss of faith in communism uh, you know, with a religious sense of loss of faith, because for him, communism was like religion, which I think is true for most um, communists, whether they realize it or not. But I do want to talk 
debate about India since we have some more time. Uh, what do you make of the state of India's economy right now as an economist? Are you happy? Are you sad? About what? The state of India's economy. Well, you know, India's, uh, India's economy as economies grow, uh, okay, only comes alive in 1991. I mean, there are 30 years of, of bad planning and all this and stuff. Even now, uh, the economy that we talk about is economy for the top 20%. You know, the Indian, Indian economic policy has singularly failed to, to utilize the huge labor surplus it has. You know, we saw during the, uh, the coronavirus last in the first lockdown of 200 million people walking across from North India to, you know, to Bihar and all that migrant labor. Now, why are they migrant labor? Because there's not enough work from, from, from where, where they live. They migrate and when that job stops, they have nowhere to live. So they have to walk all the way back. Now that is a tragedy for a country. At the same time, we have uh, unicorns and a lot of foreign capital coming in. Because if you think about, you know, in, in a billion people economy, you know, thousand million people economy, if 10%, the richest 10% are 100 million, which is larger than the UK economy, population terms, right? So even if they are not at the American level of income, they are pretty comfortable level of income, the, the, the top 10%. And to cater to them, Walmart and, and, and Apple, and Google, and everybody is willing to come because the huge market. That market and associated commercial and financial transactions, banks and all that. And then there's the rest of the economy, which is not quite uh, hand to mouth, but considerably lower income and very bad, but very inadequate health infrastructure, transport infrastructure, and so on. But of course, it's also one of the world's largest democracies. Uh, it's sort of fluff, uh, interesting you know, contradictions. Now, I think that between 1991 and say 2016, it grew at 7% more or less, uh, which it had never grown to, before it had grown about 3%. So there, the economy is capable of rapid growth, but it, it has for the last five years, uh, of course, there been coronavirus for two years and then, the economy slowed down and all that. So the economy has not been capable like uh, other East Asian economies of sustained growth. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems, I've, I've written about this, but basically in East Asia, Japan and so on, not China, but East Asia, uh, mm -hmm. there was a compact between the government and the business. And the government more or less said to the business, you export and you prove you've got quality in a, because you can sell our own people anything. When you sell to foreigners, that is quality. If you do that, we will help you with subsidies and this and that. And Japan did it first, and then South Korea did it, then Taiwan, Taiwan, Singapore, so on. This is what Deng Xiaoping saw. And Deng Xiaoping said, this is the key. We have a business sector, not as large as, uh, but they created the business, they helped the business to create, and the state plus the business. Now, India somehow politically, there's hostility to business. No politician will actually say private business is good for the economy. The jobs are created by private business. Nobody says that. Not even this is called right. Congress Wallace did not say the BGP wallers don't say. What would they may do? They may take money from them and so on. But the idea, so there is state regulation, state plan here, but there is no cooperative cohesion between the, between the two. There's a lot of crony capitalism and so on. So India always falls behind. And there's a huge bureaucracy, very bright bureaucracy. 
but not very efficient bureaucracy. And when in doubt, they create a government job. So hugely wasteful government, hugely wasteful. And you know, it, it, you know, three four, three quarters of the defense budget goes on on paying salaries. I mean, it's ridiculous. But so I think India, India lacks a single uh, agreed economic uh, program or economic philosophy. But do you also yeah. not think that that is partly because the people here don't really care about economic growth because. As we have seen in, you know, when the in 2004, the BJP wanted India signing to be its, you know, campaign motto and tried to flout its economic achievements, but it lost. In 2014 to 2019, its performance in economy was pretty bad, but you know, it still won. And it it seems to me like Indian sort of like a sort of authoritarian state, you know, in a very compact centralized state. And what they want is these non-issues, you know, arguments about history and ideology, you know, it seems to me like all of the election rhetoric is going that way. And nobody really bothers to talk about what's happening with the economy. I, I, I'm running out of time, but uh, uh, let me say this. Uh, Indian economy has demonstrated that it can grow. For 25 years, it grew at almost Chinese rates of growth. Okay. Now, obviously, the political system is very fragile in the sense that uh, we haven't had a single party majority government for a long time. BJP has majority, but it runs with a coalition. I mean, the last cabinet changes, you saw how many different little groups have to be accommodated by caste and region and this and that. So the political system, while it's democratic, it is not a, a streamlined machinery to implement anything. And there are far too many sectional demands to have to package together. Some of them are quite, quite inefficient, but you have to do this for this region and that for that, uh, you know, OBC group and you know that. Now you see, and there are lots and lots of subsidies. You know, the farmers are are are, are striking uh, in North India, but they're heavily subsidizing power fertilizers, and they want the guaranteed price. So in a sense, uh, there is a culture of dependency or culture of subsidies. And it is just productive enough not to break down. But when there is a shock like pandemic, a lot of people die unnecessarily. And so I think the Indian economy operates at 45% efficiency in it, just take a number. I mean, it's really not, not, not a streamlined, you know, um, fast-moving, efficient economy. Although there are a lot of entrepreneurial people, you know, a lot of very hardworking people, but you know, there's so much surplus labor. I would say uh, there are about, let's say, 500 million people, maybe 600 million people in the labor force. India has a very low le a level of female uh, labor force participation. Out of the 600 million people, two, 100 to 250 million are not fully employed. It's a lot of waste. Anyway, I got to go. Uh, I got to go at 12 o'clock. I sort of set aside one hour for you. Uh, more than that, I can't do. Okay. So thank uh, you very much. Thank you a lot, Desai. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and I'd love to you know, have you on again. So there are a lot that I wanted to talk about. I, you know, your book, The Rediscovery of India is one of my favorite book. So uh, okay. it was an honor to have you over here. Uh, thank you very much for doing this. And thank you. Thank you, take care, bye.